morning. <coughs> so today, <coughs> today I, I'm going to talk about gauge fields and, and entanglement entropy, but uh, I, I would like to, to make a very short comment regarding a question yesterday during the discussion session. Remember yesterday we have discussed two different methods to, to calculate entanglement entropy. Uh, so in one of them, we get an expression for the entanglement entropy in terms of correlators. And on the other hand, we get a method, uh, we, we get a result for the entanglement entropy in terms of a partition function in a single plane, but for a field with uh, this, uh, particular phases when cross the cut, okay? So the question yesterday was, okay, as both methods can be applied to free fields, uh, there must be a way to connect the two, the two results, okay? And, and the answer is yes, but the way to, to connect them, I mean, you, you need to finish the calculation. Yesterday, I, I gave you only the partial result, I mean, one, one way is, of course, you, you arrive to the end of the calculation and you see that the answer match, okay? This is one way, but it's not a proof that there's really a relation between the two methods. The other way is uh, to start uh, with the calculating the, the partition function for this special case of fields with these phases at the boundary, okay, in, in, in the plane, to do the explicit calculation of the partition function, to plug this result into the formula for the entanglement entropy, and to see that you obtain the expression of the entanglement entropy in terms of correlators, okay? So, I, I'm not going to give you the, the details, but at least the, the intermediate steps, the result of the intermediate steps, uh, so you can, you can then complete the, the derivation. So the idea is that these uh, phases for the field can be mimic uh, introducing a gauge field, okay? So you, you couple your, your field to, a, to an external gauge field, that is pure gauge everywhere except at the boundary, okay? This is like uh, attaching a vertex line, okay, a vortex line in the, in the boundary, so the field acquires these phases when crossing the boundary, okay? So the action you have is the one of a free, in the case of fermions, the, the one of a free fermion plus some interaction term. And then you have to calculate the, the partition function for this action, okay, in the Euclidean space. Uh, the calculation of the partition function, there's a, there's, a, there's a method to calculate the partition function. I mean, you, you need to, in, to, to introduce an auxiliary field. This is something that people use for example, when calculating Casimir effect, uh, when you have to introduce a constraint in your, in your theory, uh, you can do it just adding auxiliary fields and then integrating the auxiliary fields in order to realize the, the, the constraint, okay? In the case of fermions, these auxiliary fields are going to be Grassmann variables. Okay, the, the, the usual stuff. Uh, also, when, when you want to, to apply a gauge fixing, you, you do the same, okay? You, you introduce auxiliary fields. So the result for the partition function, what you get is now I tell you what is lambda. This is just one plus one, and this C is the square root 
were talking about yesterday, okay? So this is the result for the partition function. Lambda are just the phases. Uh, I don't remember the, the coefficients, but it was something like, or perhaps I have written here the coefficients. Uh, well, no, I don't have it here, but are the roots of the unity, okay? It's different from scalars than from fermions. Uh, so once you have this, of course there's, there's a middle step because you have an expression for the traces of the powers of the, of the density matrix. And then you have to find the analytic continuation in order to take the n going to one limit, okay? And the uh, expression for the entropy for the region B is just integral Writing one root. This is for scalars and for fermions, what you get is But here there's a minus one for fermions. Okay, so then if you, you plug this expression for the, of the partition function in this expression here, yes. Lambda are the phases, okay, here in this expression here. The, the point is that that's why we, we, we should discuss the, the analytic continuation. You, you transform the sum. Do you, re, you remember yesterday we saw that at the end what you get is a sum over these phases. There was a 1 over 1 minus n and the sum over k, okay? And k goes from 0 to n minus 1. These sums can be, can be done with a contour integral. This is the way you build the analytic continuation. And that's why at the end what you get is an integration over lambda, okay? Um, so if you plug this formula here, what you get is the expression of the entanglement entropy in terms of the correlator, the same expression we get from the real-time approach, okay? This is the way that, uh, that you can connect both methods, okay? Uh, I believe there's one missing formula, okay, because this is for fermions. So you have to plug this formula here, okay? You, you can do the, the, the same thing for scalars. Okay, uh, so this is the end of the, of the connection between, between the two methods, okay? So let's, let me start now discussing gauge fields. Uh, there's no volume, the, the, the region. Yes, the point is that these correlators here are restricted to your region. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. It's just the analytic continuation. Yes. Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I'm not saying how many intervals I have here, okay? I, 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 I'm, this is a general expression, okay? Uh, the, the, the point is, because I'm not solving to the end, okay? The, the, that's why I was saying one way is to solve to the end. So you find the entanglement entropy, you define your region, and you, your, you find the entanglement entropy from, with one method and the other one, and you compare the results. This is not what I'm doing here. I, I'm just uh, taking the general expression for the partition function. I'm not saying I have one, two, or three intervals, okay? Sorry? No, the problem is that for fermions, I know, I know how to calculate this partition function in terms of its, what, what result is that this uh, gauge field you introduce, I mean this, this um, uh, these vortex lines you introduce in order to mimic the phases, then the, the, the fermionic current can be bosonized and the interaction term takes a very easy uh, expression and what you get is two point functions of vertex operators in, the, in, the, in, in a scalar, in a new scalar bosonic theory, okay? So, and you know how to calculate correlators of vertex operators. And this can be done uh, for multi-component sets. In the case of the scalar field, you don't know, I mean, what, what you get. There are two things. For fermions, if you add the mass, instead of finishing in a, in a, in a, in a free bosonic theory, you end in a sine gordon theory. So you have to evaluate two-point correla correla correlations of vertex operators, but in, in a sine gordon theory. Uh, what results is a differential equation. It's a pine leve type five, okay, that you can solve, okay, but only for one interval. If you put a multi-component region, then you don't know how to solve the, the problem. And for the scalar, it's even worse in the sense that even for the massless case, you don't have this tool of bosonization, so you don't know how to solve uh, the problem of a multi-component uh, or a multi-component region. Okay, for any conformal field theory, you know one part of the answer, but there's a still some part that depends on the cross ratio that you don't know. Only for a free fermion, you know the complete answer. Okay, this is this is the point. Okay, so let's let's see what happens uh, with gauge fields. Okay, so the. The idea is that when, when we started uh, studying the, the, the relation between gauge fields and entanglement entropy, we, we found that all the results available in the, in the literature were kind of puzzling results, okay? So uh, first, uh, you, in the, in the the context of uh, black holes, uh, you can find the early result of Kavat. Uh, he found a negative contribution to the entanglement entropy, okay, known as the contact term. Uh, then later, uh, in the uh, you, you can you can find. A, 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 an exact calculation of the uh, logarithmic coefficient uh, 
for spherical sets done by Docker, and he again find, find, found something which is uh, difficult to, to, to understand. The, 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 the logarithmic coefficient was not given by the Euler anomaly as expected, okay, for spherical, for spherical regions. Uh, we have done uh, also the, the, the calculation for a Maxwell field, and we also find that, that the logarithmic coefficient does not correspond to the Euler anomaly. And also in, in lattice calculations, people have found problems to define the global Hilbert space as a bipartition, okay? The, the solution they propose is to extend the lattice and uh, what they get at the end is that the entropy has two contributions, one classical contribution coming from the boundary of the region plus the usual quantum contribution, okay? And, and okay, they, they say that the, the, the problem in, in finding properly this bipartition of the Hilbert space is that the uh, excitations in, in gauge fields are not <coughs> point-like, but are given by, by loops, okay? Uh, so the idea uh, uh, to, to study uh, gauge fields is try to understand uh, what makes uh, gauge fields so special regarding entanglement entropy, okay? Uh, we decided to, to focus on lattice gauge fields, abelian gauge fields, and we are going to, to follow an algebraic approach, okay? Uh, so, well, these references here, uh, here, wait, this reference, the pointer, ah, is this one. Okay, these references here, uh, the last one, the last one is the calculation uh, we have done with uh, Leonardo in the cylinder. So it's, uh, I, I believe it's, it's the only calculation we have in the cylinder. We have done previously the calculations in the cylinder for scalars and fermions. And uh, again, for the cylinder, we know that the uh, logarithmic coefficient has to be given by, uh, by the anomaly. Uh, but uh, uh, what we found with uh, Leonardo is that again in the, in the cylinder, the result is not the, the anomaly. So if we have time, I, I would like to show you the, the, the results. Um, so, okay, let's, let's skip the, the outline and also let's uh, skip the, the definitions and properties of entanglement entropy, but let me just uh, introduce uh, new measures of information that are going to be useful in, in what I'm going to talk about, the relative entropy and the mutual information. Okay, we, uh, we know the entanglement entropy uh, is divergent, it has um, a non-universal character in general, all the, the terms in the expansion are not universal, but this can be solved if you introduce uh, different quantities as mutual information and relative entropy. In the relative entropy, you have only one region but two states, and uh, the mutual information is a special case of relative entropy uh, that is defined, this is the definition, you need two regions. No, wait. Take. Okay, this is the, the definition. And of course, uh, by construction, these two quantities uh, are well-defined and, and finite in the continuum, okay? 
the, the boundary terms uh, get subtracted. So these are two good quantities, okay, in the, in the continuum um, we are going to use. So let's start <coughs> defining lattice gauge theories and, and how to build a gauge invariant uh, operator algebra, okay? So what happens in general, uh, we are used to, to, to put in the lattice scalars and fermions, and what you do is to attach to each side of the lattice your operators, okay? In, in gauge fields, it's uh, a little bit different. The, the elements of the group, instead of being attached to sides of the lattice, are attached to the, to the links, okay? Uh, you have also the gauge transformation variables. Oh, sorry. I'm going to do it many times, but uh, you have also these G variables. These are the gauge transformation variables. This is how you write the gauge transformation law. And uh, in the space of wave functionals, these are functionals of assignations of group of elements to all the links. You, you can distinguish, you are, you are interested in distinguish the ones that are associated to the physical states. These are the ones which are gauge invariants. Okay, and uh, with these ingredients, uh, you can define the algebra of physical operators, okay? The, 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 the natural thing to do is to associate uh, an operator L to these G variables. This operator acts in this way, okay? Uh, and then you can complete the algebra associated, uh, associating an operator also to these uh, elements U, okay? This is a, a kind of uh, coordinate uh, operator. And, uh, okay, the idea is that with these two uh, operators, we have two commuting algebras, okay, for abelian groups at least, uh, which do not commute to each other. So together, they, they are a generating set, okay, for the, for the algebra. But we are still in the, in the unphysical space, okay? Uh, and the reason is that you can show that the U operators are not gauge invariants, okay? And the gauge invariant version of these operators are the Wilson loops. Oh, wait, here. The, the, I mean, the, the L operators are okay, but the U operators uh, are not gauge invariants. The, the gauge invariant version is given by these Wilson loops. What you have to do is to close a path, okay, acting with the U operator. So these are going to be the generators, the L operators and the W operators are going to be your uh, generators of the algebra, okay? The, the complete algebra is going to build just with a tensor product over the algebras of each link, okay? Uh, what is interesting here is that uh, naturally the appears constraints equations these are uh, a consequence of the gauge invariants uh, you are asking. So, for example, the, the, this constraint here uh, over the L operators is a kind of Gauss law, okay? Uh, it, it tells you, gives you constraints to the flux of the, the electric field, and this constraint here gives you constraints to the flux of the magnetic field, okay? Um, for example, in the, for, for continuous, uh, for continuous, whoa, for continuous groups, 
uh, you can parameterize okay, the youth and the, and the L operators using uh, this um, vector field uh, A, and uh, you can rewrite the constraints in, in more standard way uh, just to see that this constraint here is related with, uh, is, uh, is the way to rewrite the Gauss law, is the more general way to write the Gauss law, and this tells you the magnetic flux has to be conserved, okay? This, this is just uh, what we know, what we actually know. But let's see what, what happens uh, if we naively uh, we have a two-dimensional lattice and we say, okay, we, we are interested in a square region and uh, you say, okay, which, uh, which is the, the natural way to put, uh, to assign this local algebra, to assign operators to this, to this region. And, and okay, the first thing you, you can think is, okay, I'm going to put all the possible links, I'm going to choose all the possible links and all the possible Wilson loops uh, within the square, okay? As, as, as we usually do with uh, scalars, okay? Uh, you draw a, a region and then all the sites inside your region have attached a phi and a pi operator, okay? So you do the same for, for gauge fields. But in this case, what happens due to the constraints is that once you have these three links within your region, you automatically have also this other link here. This is due to the constraint because the links operators coming to the same site are not independent, okay? Uh, so even if you, uh, in the beginning, didn't consider this link here, it's already uh, within your, your algebra. The same happens with these two, okay? The, the product of these two links is related with the products of these two links outside. So this tells you that uh, in the case of gauge invariant local algebras, uh, you, you have to take, I mean, you, you have to be very, uh, you have to take into account constraints in order to do the calculations because there are some uh, links or, or also Wilson loops that you are not considering considering but are inside, okay, your region due to the constraints. And, uh, okay, to, to define uh, better uh, this, this idea, we, we have to introduce new concepts. This, this, um, this can, be, can be said uh, in a more elegant way. The idea is that these local algebras can have a center. This, these are a set of operators that lives not only in your algebra, but in the commutant of the algebra. The commutant of the algebra, of course, is the set of operators that commutes with all the operators in, in the algebra, okay? So, uh, but let's, let's uh, start with the scalars. We, we are familiar with, okay? So if you, if you consider, a, again, a scalars in a lattice, and uh, you take, let me see, it's easier to do this, and, uh, okay, let's take a scalars in the lattice. Uh, this, uh, you're going to attach, a phi and a pi, okay, and, and a momentum operator to each side of the lattice, uh, and you are going to choose, you are going to say that your local algebra is generated by all the phi and pi operators within your region, okay? Uh, 
this is the natural way to define the local algebra associated to your region for a scalar field. In this case, this, this is one way to choose a local algebra associated to a region. But there's a mathematical way to define the local algebra associated to a region, and this is using this uh, double commutant that I define here. The idea is, given a set of operators and its commutant, uh, the local algebra associated to this set of operators is given by the double commutant. So you calculate the commutant, and then again, the commutant of the commutant, this gives you the double commutant, okay? Of course, these two definitions coincides, are, gives you exactly the same result for the scalar, okay? Uh, so this prescription to choose the local algebra is exactly the same as saying that the local algebra is given by the double commutant. Uh, in this case, what you are assuming is that the local algebra associated to the complementary region is given by the commutant, okay? This is what, what you are su supposing, okay? What you are assuming. And in this case, the only operator that share the, the algebra and the commutant of the algebra is the identity operator. So you can interpret this local algebra as a factor in a tensor product, okay? And, and then it's natural to define your global Hilbert space as a tensor product of these two local algebras, okay? Is it, is it clear in, in this case, as the only thing that shares the two algebras is the identity, you can introduce a bipartition of the global Hilbert space in this way. But this is not the more general case. In, in general, what happens is that in the intersection, there's not only the identity operator, but a set of operators. This is called the center of the algebra. And in this case, okay, let's, let's uh, skip this part, but in, in this case, even if it's not possible to define a bipartition of the Hilbert space as a tensor product, you can, you can still calculate an entanglement, an entropy, okay, associated, a von Neumann entropy associated to the, the density matrix. This is the, 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 the way you have to follow. You have to calculate first the density matrix for this local algebra, and then you can calculate the entropy associated to this uh, density matrix, local density matrix. And what you get is, uh, is this expression here, the, en the, the entropy has two pieces, okay? Uh, this H here is the Shannon entropy of uh, classical probability distribution. This is the classical probability distribution for the elements of the center, okay? And you have also uh, the quantum the, the standard quantum contributions. This is something that I mentioned in the beginning. People trying to do lattice calculation with gauge fields, they introduce these extended lattices, uh, as I told you, and they found exactly these two contributions to the entropy. So we can, yes, I, let me finish. And So we can interpret that what happens in their calculation is that they have a center in the way they assign local algebras to regions, okay? Yes, please. I mean, the, the, the right way to do the, the calculation is you first calculate a local density matrix associated 
to a local algebra. This is the correct way. And then the, this local algebra has to be defined as the double commutant of the set of operators. This is the right way to do, to do things. Yes. Yes, the point is that we didn't notice it before because uh, that there was something special in, the, in this assignation of local algebras to region because in the case of scalars and fermions, both prescriptions are the same. I mean, if, if you use uh, as a prescription that you are going to take all the operators that live, that are attached to sites inside the region, this prescription is exactly equivalent to take the double commutant. But for gauge fields, it's not, it's not the same. As, as I show you, if you take a square and you take everything that is inside, what you get is something which is outside, and this is, you, this is due to the constraints, okay? Uh, I mean, all the links operators are not independent when, when they, they come to the same, the same site, okay? Yes. Yes. No, I, I mean the, the Hilbert. Uh, uh, you are all. You always have a Hilbert space, okay? Even if you are talking about algebras. No, yes, no. Of course. I mean, you don't, you, don't, you don't need to connect both languages because are already connected. I, I mean, in the, 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 only, the only thing that is difficult is that uh, only in the case that you have a trivial center, you can uh, express the global Hilbert space as a bipartition using a tensor product. But otherwise, you cannot, but still, that's why, well, I skip the, I skip the, but still, even when, when you have a center, it's possible to, to do partial traces. It's not, you, you are right that it's not the standard, okay, you say, okay, now I don't have a tensor product in the Hilbert space, so what is the definition of, partial trace in this, in this language. Well, it's possible to do, to restrict your, your, your global density matrix to the local, to the, to the local algebra A, let's say, okay? I, I, I skip, we, we can see the, I mean the, no, the idea, the idea, okay, we, we can, we, we can spend, well, we can, we can spend some time with this. The idea is you take a basis that diagonalize all the elements in the center. In this, in this basis, also, uh, I mean, the, the, this matrix take a block diagonal form. And uh, once you have, I mean, the, the algebra generated by A and its commutator, and, and its commutant, this is what I wrote here, has a block diagonal form. And uh, from here, you can, you can write the, the density matrix associated with this, and then you partial trace on each block, okay? And uh, you know the answer is the correct because this, uh, reduced density matrix gives you the correct expectation values of the operators within the, the algebra, okay? The the algebra. Yes, yes. Okay, yes, 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 <laughs> sorry. Okay, so uh, once we are here, uh, again, we, we have to rethink some properties of the entanglement entropy because now we are not talking about 
entanglement entropy associated to regions. Now we are talking about entanglement entropy associated to algebras, okay? So we have to rewrite the properties uh, in terms of, of algebras. Uh, but uh, one of the properties that I'm going to use is this one here. And uh, remember, we were saying the, the, the entropy of the region, uh, if the global state is pure, is the same as the entropy of the complementary region. And the, the way to say it in terms of algebras is to say that the entropy associated to an algebra and the entropy associated to the commutant of the algebra is the same, okay? Okay, let's, let's uh, well, something is, is important. Uh, just pay attention to this property here of the mutual information. The mutual information satisfies this inequality, this means that it's increasing with inclusion of algebras. This means that if you have, uh, if you add operators to your algebra, the mutual information uh, is bigger, okay? So let's, uh, I have started at 10? No, no, I have still 15 minutes, okay. Um, so let's see uh, <coughs> how ambiguities appears for the entanglement entropy due to this uh, freedom we have in the assignation of local algebras to regions. So suppose again that you are interested in a square region in a two-dimensional lattice and we have say, okay, the, the, the first try you, you can do is, uh, I'm going to take into account everything, okay? I will put all the links and all the Wilson loops. And what happens in this case is that due to the constraints, you have a center, and the center corresponds to all these links here, okay? The commutant of the algebra is this shaded region here, okay? And you can check that these operators, these links operators that live in the center belongs also to the algebra and to the commutant of the algebra. And now suppose you say, okay, no, I, I want to get rid of the center, so I'm going to start erasing links operators in the boundary and you arrive in the other extreme to this situation here. We call it magnetic center. If you erase all the links in the boundary, uh, you still have a center. But now the center is the Wilson loop he that lives here in the boundary, okay? The, the, the commutant of the algebra is again this shaded region and this Wilson loop belongs also to the algebra and to the commutant of the algebra. So in both cases, you have center. In the middle, of course, you have an infinite number of, of ways to assign the local algebra to the region, to a square, okay? You can erase one link, two, three, I mean, you, you can choose. And of course, in the middle, there's a way to choose the algebra in such a way that the center is only uh, the identity operator, so you have a trivial center. So let me, let me show you this here. Uh, you can, okay, I, I, I'm not going to give you the proof, but the, the idea is that uh, if you start playing with uh, with links and assignations of uh, Wilson loops and links, you find that the way to, to get rid of the center is that on the boundary, I mean, this, this is the, the election, the set uh, of links on the boundary whose link operators do not belong to the algebra must be a maximal tree, 
okay? So this is the way to get rid of the center. This is an example, okay? But again, the solution is not unique. You have many maximal trees you can draw in the boundary. So you have many elections of algebras without center or with trivial center, okay? Still, we have ambiguities. But we will see that all these, uh, all these possible maximal trees that gives you no center have exactly the same entropy. The problem comes when you choose an algebra with a center. These are the ambiguities. Okay, this, uh, let's skip also this. What, what I was saying in, in, what I'm saying here is that this uh, fixing of maximal trees on the boundaries are equivalent to a gauge fixing, okay, in the lattice. And you can prove that this prescription effectively cuts the degrees of freedom inside and outside. So you are able to write the global Hilbert space as a tensor product, okay? I want to, to arrive to the examples, but no. Uh, okay, um, let's skip this and this here. Examples. Um, what I have skipped is that also in the case of scalars, you can have, uh, if you choose a different prescription for uh, assign the, the local algebra to the region, you can have a center. For example, uh, you can choose all the, the phi's and pi's within the region and on the boundary, you choose, for example, only the phi operators. And then you have a center and uh, you have a contribution, a classical contribution to the entropy, but as is ill-defined in the continuum, okay, I, I prefer to, to skip this part. So let's see what, happen, what happens if we study here, no. Yeah. If we study a Maxwell field in two plus one dimensions. So the idea is that we are going to put in the lattice a Maxwell field, okay? But we are going to take a slightly different uh, strategy. We are going to start with a physical, electric, and magnetic field instead of the, the Wilson loops, okay, and links operators. Uh, the idea is that the electric field is associated to the links and the magnetic field is associated to each plaquette in the, lat in the, in the lattice, okay? Um, but in two plus one dimensions, we have a duality uh, between the Maxwell field and a massless scalar field. So you can write the electric and magnetic field, this is the discrete version of the duality, in terms of scalars and the conjugate momentum, okay? And so you have a dual lattice. Uh, you can, uh, for example, uh, this, this link here that is associated to a, a, a vertical um, electric field, uh, it's going to be given by this link operator here in the dual lattice, which is just which is defined here, this is phi hat, yes, phi hat one, uh, it's going to be, I don't see, well, uh, this, is, this is the definition of phi hat one and this is the definition of phi hat two. No, on the, is, is no, okay, it, this is phi hat, two and this is phi hat one because vertical operators in, in one lattice corresponds to perpendicular operators in the dual lattice, okay? And the, what is easy is the disidentification. 
once you have a magnetic operator in this lattice, you have a pi in the dual lattice. So this is how it looks, these different choices for a square lattice, uh, for a square region, both lattices, okay? These are magnetic fields and you have all these, you choose all the links with electric fields, so due to constraints you have also these links here. This is the, the, what we call the electric center. In the middle we have the trivial center. As I told you, you have to choose a maximal tree. You have to erase a maximal tree on the boundary. This is in the, in the Maxwell lattice and this is what you get in the dual scalar lattice. And the same for the magnetic center, okay? We have a race, all the links on the boundary, and this corresponds to this configuration in the dual lattice. And now, uh, we can use, we, we have, we know uh, how to do calculations in the lattice using the method we discussed yesterday. So what we have to do is to calculate correlators and we are going to calculate correlators in this dual lattice, okay? Um, but the problem is that now uh, the setup of the problem is slightly different from the setup I described yesterday. Instead of having uh, the, the, the commutation relations are, are different. Here uh, we have more, a more general situation uh, with a, a C number here in the commutation relations. But you can fix this problem. You, I, I'm not going to, to give you the details, but still you can uh, express the entropy. This, this is the quantum part of the entropy. It's given in terms of this uh, quantity theta is, is the analog of the C uh, we have defined yesterday. And it's again the square root of two correlators, but this is, these are slightly different from the ones we defined yesterday because you, you have to take into account this C that appears in the commutation relations. And also we have an expression we need an expression for the classical contribution, okay? So this is the way you can write the entropy. And now you can do uh, the calculation. And what you get is this. For example, if you want to calculate the, the mutual information between two squares, what you get, and, and this is, uh, interesting because uh, for all possible assignations, the electric center, the trivial center, and the magnetic center, you get exactly the same result, okay, in the, in the continuum limit. And uh, you can check that the classical mutual information goes, goes to zero. So mutual information, doesn't see if you have or you don't have a center in your algebra. So there's no ambiguities in the mutual information, okay? Uh, now let me show you uh, what happens if we compare uh, the result for the gauge field with the result for a scalar. And what you get is that always the, the result for the gauge is bounded by the result of the, scare, uh, for, of the scalar. And this is uh, consistent with the inequality I showed you uh, before, saying that if, if you enlarge your algebra, uh, the mutual information uh, is going to be bigger, okay? And this is what happens here because the gauge model is the subalgebra of the scalar model. In the, in the gauge model, you only have the derivatives, okay, of the, of the scalar. And, uh, okay, 
this is for no way okay so let me spend the last five minutes discussing this this example we have done the calculation also in three plus one dimensions and the idea was to calculate the logarithmic coefficient okay of the entanglement entropy we know that the, the or at least we expect the, the logarithmic coefficient has to be given by the Euler anomaly and uh, what what we get is uh, something different okay the, the idea here there's no need to put the, the, the theory on the lattice so this is a, a little bit different because uh, what you get at the end is that you can rewrite uh, the result for the gauge field in terms of scalars and you already know how to calculate the scalars I mean, you, you know the coefficients, the logarithmic coefficients for scalars, so you don't need to do the calculation, okay? So you, you start uh, writing, okay, this is the writing the, the Hamiltonian uh, in terms of the physical uh, fields, B and E. This is just the discrete version of the, of, of the Hamiltonian. You end, I mean, you, you can integrate uh, due to the, we, we are doing the calculation in, in, in a sphere, okay? The, the, the region is, is a sphere. So uh, you can integrate all the, the, angular, uh, the angular part and you end with a radial Hamiltonian, a Hamiltonian in one dimension, okay? This is, this is the answer for the, a Maxwell field. If you do the same for a scalar, the Hamiltonian you get is this one. If you compare both Hamiltonians, uh, what you see is that are exactly the same. You have two copies of scalars, but what is missing is the zero mode the L equals zero mode of the scalar. So the sums over L goes, uh, in the case of the gauge field, instead of going from zero, uh, it just starts in one. So there's something missing in the, gauge, in, the, in the case of the gauge field. But you know the logarithmic coefficient for the scalar, for the complete scalar, and you know the logarithmic coefficient for the zero mode. And uh, what you get is this number here, which is exactly what Docker found in a completely different calculation, mapping the problem in the sphere to the ADS, ADS and calculating the thermodynamic entropy. What, what he get is this number here, which is not the, the anomaly, which it should be this number here. So, uh, what is happening is still open. Uh, why? We, of course, we can fix this number. This calculation is done without a center. So, we can fix this number choosing a center. And uh, what gives you a, the, the, the proper result if you choose the electric center? and then you will have a classical contribution. For me, it's not clear why we have to choose the electric center and not, I don't know, the magnetic center. Probably there's a physical reason why the assignation of the local algebra, the, the proper assignation of the local algebra to the region is given by this particular election of the algebra but uh, so far, it's, it's not clear to me. Okay, I, I'm not going to have time to discuss the cylinder, but uh, it happens something very similar. 
You, you Again, Can Rewrite, The Hamiltonian. Uh, just one comment. You, you can ask yourself why I'm asking why I'm asking, I, I'm writing the Hamiltonian. Okay, I just start with the Hamiltonian because I want to calculate then the correlators. Here, uh, I don't need to calculate, I, I don't need to go on with the calculation because at this stage I can compare scalars with Maxwell and I know how to solve scalars. The same happens in the cylinder. You get two copies of scalars there's something missing, the, uh, and, and the answer for the anomaly is different from the coefficient we get in the calculation. Again, you can fix the, the problem adding a center, but uh, okay, my conclusion is that so far it's not clear to me uh, why uh, one assignation is better than the other one, okay?